Greetings, contract law students. I'm Professor Seth C. Orenberg, and today I'm going to explain what are contract remedies and how to calculate them. The word remedy appears to originate from the root re, meaning back or back to the original place, and med, meaning to take appropriate measure. The term comes from the Anglo-Saxon French term, meaning a cure for a disease, but by the mid 15th century, the Anglican use of the term came to mean legal redress. And this meaning of remedy, of a legal redress, an award that a court will grant to a successful party in a case, that's the meaning we'll be using today. A remedy is thus a sort of legal solution that takes appropriate measure to put parties in their original place or the place that they ought to be. If you imagine the scale of justice image, a remedy is like the weight required to restore the balance of the scales. Redress conveys the gist of remedies, although you'll soon learn that not all modern remedies are backwards looking in this way. Contract remedies, in fact, ordinarily are prospective. They look forward to the expectation of the parties. In fact, contract damages are usually measured by what's called the expectation interest, which is roughly measured as what the aggrieved party expected to get out of the bargain. The restatement of contract second identifies three specific remedial interests. They are known as the expectation interest, the reliance interest, and the restitution interest. The expectation interest is the interest in having a benefit of the bargain. And it is measured by being put in as good a position as a party would have been had the contract been performed. In other words, the expectation interest is prospective. The reliance interest is the interest in being reimbursed for loss caused by reliance on the contract and is measured by being put in as good a position as they would have been in had the contract never been made. And third, the restitution interest is the interest in having restored to a party any benefit they conferred upon the other. Modern contract remedies come in two main forms. Money damages, which are essentially an amount of cash that courts require one party to pay the other, and the equitable remedies, which include specific performance and injunction, where a court compels a party to do or not to do something other than to pay money. In general, the money damages can be referred to as remedies at law, and specific performance and injunction are considered to be remedies at equity. The legal tradition in the United States favors money damages favors money damages over equitable remedies because money awards promote finality and involve less judicial supervision over the parties after the case has been resolved. In both instances of money damages and equitable remedies, the goal is the same. The goal of contractual remedies is not usually to put the aggrieved party back in the place it was before the contract, but rather to put the aggrieved party in the place it would have been in had the contract been performed as promised. However, it's not always possible for courts to determine what would have happened if a contract was performed. When the future is too uncertain for a prospective remedy, courts might instead require a retrospective one. Contractual remedies generally being forward-looking, the most common contractual remedy is expectation damages. Expectation damages are simply stated as the sum of money paid by a breaching party to an aggrieved party. That puts the aggrieved party in the place it reasonably expected to be had the contract been fully performed. For example, a seller who fails to deliver goods may be responsible for the profits the buyer would have earned in reselling them. Sometimes this predictive calculation is difficult or impossible in which case the court will award reliance damages, which cleave more closely to the etymology of the term remedies 
and seek to heal the situation, to restore it, and to put the aggrieved party in the position it would have been in had the contract never been formed. Courts may also order restitution, which is the return on a party's ill-gotten gains. For example, a party may require a seller to return the purchase price upon failing to deliver goods. In even rarer cases, courts will order specific performance where a party must do and a court will order a sheriff to require a party to, to make a party do something other than merely pay money. Courts generally will not order specific performance where money damages can adequately compensate an injured party. A notable exception is for sales of land because land is considered unique under law. So sellers may more often be required to transfer land instead of paying buyers for its value. But courts are hesitant to require the executive branch of our government to cause a party to do or not to do a certain thing. And so specific performance is rarely granted. Finally, courts may order an injunction, which stems from the Latin injunctio, meaning a command. It's related to the term injuri, meaning fastened to a yoke. An injunction, therefore, is a command that binds, halts, or harnesses. Under contract law, an injunction is where a court prohibits a party from doing some act that is prohibited by the contract. For example, some employment contracts have non-compete covenants, whereby an employee promises not to work for an employer's competitors for a specific period of time. Although many have argued that such non-compete should be unenforceable as a matter of public policy favoring entrepreneurial liberty, courts in many states enforce these covenants through a negative injunction, prohibiting a party from working for a competitor pursuant to the agreement they made. The typical purpose of remedies is to place the injured party in as good a position it would have been in had the other party fully performed the contract. For this reason, the remedies are most commonly calculated according to what is called the expectation or expectancy interest. That is, the standard money damages, the standard remedy for a contract breach, is calculated pursuant to how much an aggrieved party expected to gain under a contract. Expectation damages, the standard measure of money damages for breaches of contract, are based on the difference between what an aggrieved party expected under a contract and what it received. There are four ways to measure such expectation damages. First, loss in value of contract performance. Second, loss of use of property. Third, loss in market price of goods. And fourth, cost of completing performance. Courts don't apply all four measures to one calculation. Rather, courts would apply the one measure which best fits the nature of the case presented. The restatement second of contract sets out what amounts to a formula for figuring expectation damages. And it says, the injured party has a right to damages based on their expectation interest as measured by A, the loss in the value to them of the other party's performance caused by the other party's failure or deficiency, plus any other loss, including incidental or consequential loss caused by the breach, less C, any cost or other loss that they have avoided by not having to perform. This primary measure of expectation damages is also known as the loss in value method of calculating damages. Loss in value is the preferred method of calculating money damages where courts can fairly determine what is the loss. Loss in value makes the most sense where one party wanted the other to perform some specific task. I'll use an example for the next few slides about plowing the snow out of my driveway because I'm recording this in October and I'm thinking of hiring someone to make sure that the snow doesn't build up in my New Hampshire driveway home. So for example, if I hire you to plow the snow out of my driveway before my birthday party so my guests can park in my driveway, 
the value of the contract to me is somewhat lost if you don't plow my driveway until after the party is over. I wanted you to plow the driveway so that my guests could use it. And I got a plowed driveway, but I didn't get it in time. After the party is over, it's too late for you to complete performance, so there must be some breach. How would a court determine the amount of the breach? Well, a court might determine the total loss by subtracting how much the plowed driveway is worth to me after the party from how much value I expected to have from having it before and having a place for my guests to park. The total loss then is the difference between what I got, a plowed driveway versus what I expected, a plowed driveway before a party with room for my guests to park. There is some difference in that value. It may be nominal, it may be significant, but that's the difference in my expectation. Now, if I haven't paid you for the work, that non-payment is a cost I avoided because under this contract, I expected to pay you if you perform the service. And any other cost avoided should therefore be subtracted from my expectancy interest because the goal is to put me in a position as good as if the contract had been performed. In the example I just gave you about failing to snowplow my driveway before my birthday party, the direct loss is calculated as the difference in value between what I expected to receive, which is my driveway plowed before my party, and what I actually received, which is my driveway plowed after my party. The difference is the direct loss. In addition to this direct loss, there may also be indirect losses. And total loss is the sum of direct loss plus permissible indirect losses. To determine which indirect losses count, some courts distinguish indirect losses into two categories, known as incidental damages and consequential damages. This distinction can be confusing, and some courts don't sharply distinguish between these two kinds and rather focus on whether indirect losses were reasonably foreseeable. Once we see how some courts make this distinction, you might see the distinction does not matter so much as long as courts don't count losses that are not reasonably foreseeable. Incidental losses are said to directly result from the direct loss. For example, if I promise, if you promise, if you promise to plow my driveway, and if you fail to do it, I incur the direct loss of an unplowed driveway. I will likely also incur the indirect loss of shoveling the snow out of the driveway myself, which takes my time and effort, or hiring someone else to plow it, which takes time to find the person and money to pay them. By defining incidental losses as a kind of indirect loss that directly results from the direct loss, we implicitly define incidental losses as reasonably foreseeable losses that should count. So maybe you see what I'm getting at is that we can define all of indirect losses as only counting when they're reasonably foreseeable. This becomes more clear when we further define consequential losses. Consequential losses are said to indirectly result from the special circumstances surrounding the direct loss. If, for example, I have to cancel my birthday party because you failed to plow my driveway, and the result of that is no one can get to my remote mountain home, that is more properly categorized as a consequential damage instead of an incidental damage because it's somewhat unusual that a person would cancel a party because of a failure in snow removal. That's not a necessary direct consequence. Again, a direct consequence of failure of snow removal is removing the snow by some other means. A more indirect consequence, and maybe an unforeseeable one, is canceling a party. A court should determine whether my loss of the party was reasonably foreseeable by you, the snowplower. If I had said to you, for example, if you don't plow my driveway on time, I'll have to cancel my party, which will cost me thousands of dollars in wasted food and entertainment. 
then it's probably reasonable to count the loss of my party as part of the indirect losses. If, on the other hand, no reasonable person would cancel a party simply because guests had to walk a little further, then the loss of the party probably should not count as an indirect loss. Some courts don't bother with this distinction between incidental losses, which inherently count, and consequential damages, which only count if they're reasonably foreseeable, and instead simply hold that indirect losses are only recoverable to the extent that they're reasonably foreseeable. I think that in practice, this generally achieves the same result. The seminal case on the rule regarding unforeseeability as a limit on consequential damages is Hadley v. Baxendale, which the restatement summarizes in its first illustration and comment under this section. And the illustration is A, a carrier, contracts with B, a miller, to carry B's broken crankshaft to its manufacturer for repair. B tells A when they make the contract that the crankshaft is part of B's milling machine and that it must be sent at once, but does not mention the mill is stopped because B has no replacement. Because A delays in carrying the crankshaft, B loses profit during an additional period while the mill is stopped because of the delay. The result, A is not liable for B's loss of profit. Why? That consequential loss was not foreseeable by A as a probable result of the breach at the time the contract was made because A did not know the broken crankshaft was necessary for the operation of the mill. The upshot of the Hadley case is that a contracting party is generally expected to take account of risks that are foreseeable at the time it makes the contract. A contracting party is not, however, liable in the event of a breach for loss that it did not at the time of contracting have reason to foresee as a probable result of such breach. Again, there's a limitation on indirect losses. They must be reasonably foreseeable in order to be awarded. And courts describe this as a limit on consequential damages. Courts will not award indirect damages for costs that could and should have been avoided. Some academics say that aggrieved parties have a duty to mitigate damages, meaning the aggrieved party must take action, such as caring for defective goods until they can be returned so they don't spoil, or by quickly hiring someone else to perform some substitute performance so there's less loss from the breach. But I don't think of this as an affirmative duty because to me, the word duty implies there's some basis for a lawsuit upon breach of that duty. Rather than an independent lawsuit, an aggrieved party simply loses the right to collect damages for indirect losses that could have been reasonably avoided. This is not an affirmative duty because the breaching party doesn't have the right to sue or counterclaim for a failure to mitigate damages. Rather, it's more like an affirmative defense where the breaching party could say that its damages are limited because the other party failed to mitigate some of them. Regardless of how you think of it, keep in mind that an aggrieved party cannot collect losses for damages it should have reasonably avoided. When loss in value is hard to determine or calculate, courts have three alternative formulas for expectation damages. The first alternative expectation damage formula pertains specifically to the loss of use of property that has some rental value or interest rate. If a breach delays the use of property and the loss in value to the injured party is not proved with reasonable certainty, the injured party may recover damages based on the rental value of the property or on the interest value of the property. Obviously, this loss of use calculation only pertains to property that can be used. This is not the best method for calculating the expectancy interest on services or marketable goods for resale.
Parties who breach contracts are generally not required to specifically complete their performance. Rather, they're ordered to pay money damages pursuant to the expectation interest. But where that expectation interest cannot be easily calculated by other methods, a court can calculate the expectation interest based on how much it would cost for performance to be completed. For example, if you promise to build me a complete house and you fail to put a roof on it, a court could assess damages based on how much it actually cost me to hire someone else to put a roof on the house. You could think of it this way. What I expected was a complete house. What I got is a house without a roof. We might not easily say how much a house without a roof is worth, and we may not know what that complete house is worth to me or on the market. It's hard to determine as an abstract number. There is no market for roofless houses. However, by determining the cost of roofing the house, we can establish the difference in value between the roofless house that I got and the roofed house I expected to receive. Note that courts will only allow for the reasonable cost. I cannot get an estimate from the world's most expensive roofer to install gold-plated shingles and charge you that amount nor will courts order the completion of performance where completing performance is far more expensive than the complete thing is worth. Some jobs are simply not worth doing. The classic case of PV House vs. Garland Coal Company illustrates where courts will not require a breaching party to pay the cost of completing performance. In this case, the PV House family leased some of their land to Garland Coal to use for strip mining. The lease contract included a term that Garland shall return the land to its natural terrain. But Garland didn't do that. Rather, it left a lot of hills behind that made the land ugly and scarred. The PV houses sued Garland for the amount it would cost to restore the land. But the court refused to grant this amount because the land was relatively worthless anyway. It would cost far more to restore that land then the restored land would be worth. As a litmus test, the court may have reasoned that if the PV houses got their money damages from Garland in the amount of what it would cost to complete performance by restoring the land, they wouldn't have done it. They wouldn't have spent that money on restoring the land because it simply wasn't worth it. This case illustrates how the cost of completing performance is only available as a measure of the expectancy interest where it is reasonable and not clearly disproportionate to the loss in value. Instead of awarding damages based on a measurement of the expectancy interest, which again is the typical remedy for breaches of contract, courts might employ an alternative measure of money damages. Courts do not punish parties for breach of contract and punitive damage are not available unless the breaching party committed some additional wrong as a tort. Courts do generally allow parties to privately order their commercial affairs, including what should happen in the event of some breach. Where parties agree in advance to a measure of damages, that's called liquidated damages. And courts will usually abide by the party's wishes and award these liquidated damages instead of independently calculating some other award. But once again, liquidated damages will only be granted when they don't constitute unfair penalties. Where the parties have not agreed to some measure of damages and where money damages cannot be calculated to a reasonable certainty pursuant to the expectancy interest, which again looks prospectively to how much an aggrieved party would receive if the contract had been performed, then courts may award reliance damages based on the reliance interest, which instead looks retrospectively at how much it should have cost to put the aggrieved party back in the position it would have been in had the contract never been formed. Somewhat similarly, courts can also order restitution damages, which require one party to return to the other whatever ill-gotten gain it derived under a contract. Contract law is not designed to punish the breaking of promises. Rather, it's designed to encourage rationally the keeping of promises based on pecuniary financial interest. Moreover, the measure of damages as a default is expectation damages, which seeks to ensure that contractual parties get the financial benefit of the bargain, regardless of whether the other party performs. In fact, 
there is a concept called efficient breach, where the most socially productive solution is for one party to breach and to pay damages instead of performing. And courts recognize this. For example, imagine that Pixie grows carrots, and Pixie enters into a contract to sell her entire fall crop for $1 per ton to Campbell's Soup. Before harvest time, a scientist discovers that Pixie's carrots contain an enzyme that can be used to treat ocular cancer. And the scientist is willing to pay Pixie $100 per ton for her carrots. The scientist hopes to use those carrots to make medicine that will cure thousands and make millions or billions of dollars in the process. In this situation, both Pixie and society and the scientist are better off if her carrots become medicine and not soup. So from all of their perspectives, she should breach her agreement with Campbell's and sell the carrots to the scientist. But what about Campbell's? How can that party be made whole? Let's say that similar carrots, which are equal substitutes in the soup making process, cost $2 a ton on the open market. The best result for society is that Pixie should sell her carrots to the scientist for $100 per ton and pay Campbell's $1 per ton. Then Campbell's can go out and get carrots for the net cost of the $1 per ton that it bargained for. In the eyes of contract law, Pixie has done nothing ethically wrong under the situation. Whether her own morals dictate otherwise is another matter. And for this reason, contract law generally does not punish breaching parties, but only requires them to make the aggrieved party whole. Punitive damages, therefore, are not recoverable for a breach of contract, unless the breach of contract is also a tort. There are exceptions to this rule. Contracts can be torts and crimes, as well as breaches of contract. There are things like torturous interference with contracts. But again, those are cases where some other law is doing the work of requiring punitive damages. So they're not true exceptions. The rule is that contract law does not punish people for breaking their agreements. It just requires them to pay the value of what they would have done. Liquidated damages is a fancy word for an amount of damages the parties agreed on in advance. It's an amount of damages that was contractually stipulated by the parties as hopefully some reasonable estimate of the actual damages that would have occurred if one or the other party breached the agreement. If parties to a contract have agreed on liquidated damages, if they have predefined how much one should pay the other in the event of a breach, in general, that is the proper measure of damages, whether it exceeds or falls short of the actual damages. Liquidated damages are also termed stipulated damages or estimated damages, where the terms of a contract specify a sum payable for non-performance it's a question of construction whether the sum is to be treated as liquidated damages or as a penalty. And penalties are not permitted under contract law. Contract law is not designed to be punitive. Rather, it's meant to be restorative, giving the parties the benefit of the bargain that they expected. The difference between penalties and liquidated damages is this. The amount recoverable in the case of a penalty is not the sum named but the damage actually incurred because the penalty will be disregarded and the court will instead determine damages for itself. Liquidated damages, therefore, must be reasonable in order to be granted. Liquidated damages that are unreasonably large or unreasonably small constitute a penalty to one party or the other instead of compensation. The idea of contract law is compensation and expectation not about punishment. So if liquidated damages are unreasonable because they are wholly disproportionate, then they are deemed penalties and courts will disregard them and elect some other manner of damages instead. Expectation damages are the preferred measure of damages because they put the party in the place it would have been in had the contract been performed. And this creates the proper incentives for parties to perform their obligations, or, where it's truly efficient, to breach them and to pay. But this calculation is not always possible 
because the future is inherently uncertain. Expectation damages may be hard to calculate in some cases and inappropriate in others. When forward-looking damages based on the expectation interest are unavailable or inappropriate, courts can instead look backwards to remedies based on the reliance interest. Unlike expectation damages, which attempt to put the injured party in the position it would have been in had the contract been performed, reliance damages attempt to put the injured party back in the position it was in before the contract was formed at all. Restatement of Contracts 2nd, Section 349 provides the formula for calculating reliance damages. As an alternative to the measure of damages stated in 347, that is, as an alternative and not in addition to, but in an alternative to expectation damages, an injured party has a right to damages based on reliance interest, including expenditures made in preparation for performance or in performance less any loss that the party in breach can prove with reasonable certainty the injured party would have suffered had the contract been performed. Reliance damages may be awarded where lost profits are too uncertain. For example, where a new business cannot begin because of a contractual breach. How much money would a new business have earned? It's difficult enough to predict how many profits a large, well-established corporation would earn in a quarter. It may be nearly impossible to estimate how much an incipient business would have profited had it opened in the first place. The common law expressly prohibits courts from awarding damages for highly uncertain losses. Damages are not recoverable for loss beyond an amount that the evidence permits to be established with reasonable certainty. Instead of speculating, courts will award damages based on the reliance interest. Again, this reliance interest is based conceptually on restoring an aggrieved party to the position they were in before the contract was formed. It looks retrospectively to the past and tries to unwind the deal. This can usually be calculated by subtracting any cost of the aggrieved party's non-performance of the contract from any expenditures made in forming and performing under the contract. In other words, what the party did in order to perform the contract minus anything that it did not do because of the contract results in the amount of reliance damages. Setting the equation aside for a moment, the concept is how do we unwind things and put the clock back to the time before the contract was formed to put the party in the position it was in before the contract was established. That's how we measure reliance damages. Restitution and unjust enrichment is a body of law that exists separate from contract law. It offers remedies generally available in law, even outside of contract law. Here, we focus on contractual restitution. But the purpose of restitution, regardless of the specific doctrine of law under which it applies, the purpose of restitution is always the same. The purpose of awarding restitution damages is to prevent unjust enrichment. Unjust enrichment is where one party benefits at the other party's expense in a manner that the law deems unfair. This includes unearned profits, monies received as a result of clerical errors, and other things that should not be ethically kept. Restitution damages are the only type of monetary damages for breach that is recoverable by both the breaching party as well as the injured party. In fact, restitution damages are not directly tied to breach at all. In other words, an aggrieved party who has fully performed its obligations under a contract and thus has not itself breached may still be required to make restitution to a breaching party in certain cases where equity, fairness, and justice so require. When a breach occurs, the party who breached may be unjustly enriched unless the law grants a remedy to the injured party, but it is also possible that the party who did not breach may be unjustly enriched unless the law grants a remedy to the breaching party. So the Restatement Second of Contract, Section 370, which defines restitutionary damages, does not mention breach at all. It reads, a party is entitled to restitution under the rules stated in this restatement only to the extent they have conferred a benefit on the other party by way of part performance or reliance. 
The measure of restitution damages is the value of the benefit that one party conferred upon the other party, regardless of breach. For example, if a contractor abandoned work for the construction of a garage when the work was partially completed, the owner is entitled to return of any partial payments that were made to the contractor, and the contractor is presumptively entitled to restitution for the value of the work. However, a breaching party who acted in bad faith may be denied any recovery for restitution. This is, after all, an equitable concept. Think of the word unjust enrichment. And we don't generally grant justice to bad actors. Before we move on to the equitable remedies of specific performance and negative injunction, let's review the three interests that form the theoretical basis of money damages. Those are the expectancy interest, the reliance interest, and the restitutionary interest. The expectation or expectancy interest deals with what the parties expected to receive had the contract been performed. Promises should be kept. If a party doesn't perform under its promises, courts will generally require it to pay the value of that performance. The idea is to put the party in the position it would have been in had the contract been fully performed. Sometimes it's impossible to see the future, and instead courts will try to unwind to the past. Reliance damages, based on the reliance interest, try to put the party in the position it was in had the contract never been formed. This is a second best approach. It doesn't give parties the proper incentives to abide by the contract or to efficiently breach, but it does provide a type of remedy where expectation is unavailable. The restitution interest sits right at the edge of contract law and other bodies of law. The purpose of restitution is also to restore to a party what it deserves by causing another party to disgorge ill-gotten gains. The restorative purpose of restitution contrasts with expectancy damages. Again, expectancy damages put a party in the place it would be in in the future had the other party fully performed. But the purpose of reliance and restitution and the interests in reliance and the interests on restitution seem similar. Both the remedies of reliance and restitution seek to put the party in the position they would be in had the contract never been formed. So how do they defer? Well, first and foremost, reliance damages are only available to a non-breaching party. The breaching party cannot recover in reliance. Whereas a breaching party may be able to recover under restitution so long as it's not at fault or a bad actor. Also, restitution is a body of law based on the principle of unjust enrichment, about the disgorgement of ill-gotten gains, about the correction of mistakes. Where one party retains a benefit conferred by another, not as a gift, and said under circumstances when compensation is reasonably expected, there's a basis for restitution although not necessarily for reliance. Restitution remedies at contract law are not based on loss, but rather on gain, ill-gotten gain. Reliance is based on loss. The benefit that one party received from the other party in performance of a contract may have been items such as good, land, or securities, services, or money. Restitution consists of returning the value of those items or specific restitution, the return of those items themselves. Reliance damages, on the other hand, focuses on costs incurred by the plaintiff. Again, this is distinguishable from restitution damages, which focus on benefits improperly received. Recovery for restitution is measured by the value of the benefit that was conferred, not by the contract price. However, restitution under contract law may sometimes be limited by the contract price. It isn't measured by the contract price, but it may be limited to the value of the contract. If parties enter into a valid contract, many courts would be reluctant to grant a party more in restitution than it would have earned under the expectancy interest. In other words, courts will generally limit the amount of restitution damages at a maximum to the expectancy interest. Most courts would find that the contract price represents a ceiling on the amount of restitution a party is entitled to recover. Restitution is therefore a unique remedy. In many cases, both parties are entitled to receive it, and they offset each other. 
Both parties may be required to disgorge the benefits received under the bargain. This may in effect return the parties both to the status quo before the contract was formed. This seems like reliance damages, but again, reliance damages are only to return to the status quo the non-breaching aggrieved party, not both parties. Now that we understand these three interests and how they theoretically form the basis of calculation for money damages, let's take a quick look at the equitable remedies of specific performance and negative injunction. Despite the Latin maxim, pacta sunt servanda, meaning promises must be kept, who should require promises to be kept? Courts have limited enforcement powers. In fact, it's the role of the executive to enforce the law. It's the role of the judiciary to decide what the law is. Should a court order some action? If it does, generally a member of the executive branch, such as a sheriff, must ensure the order is carried out. This is a more odorous and invasive process than merely requiring someone to pay money or even garnering a bank account. For these reasons, these equitable remedies of specific performance and negative injunction are somewhat exceptional and are rarely granted. Specific performance involves a court order directing an executive officer to cause a party to a contract to perform its obligations or to be in contempt of court, which can result in arrest. The result is the rendering as nearly as practicable of a promise performed through a judgment or decree. It is a court ordered remedy that requires precise fulfillment of a legal or contractual obligation in specifics. Specific performance is only granted where money damages are wholly inappropriate or totally inadequate. Sometimes they're granted where there is a sale of specific real estate or where a rare article is involved. It is an equitable remedy that lies within the court's discretion to award whenever the common law remedy is insufficient, either because damages are inadequate or because they cannot be estimated. But again, courts are very hesitant to grant this except in very special cases. Specific performance is also termed specific relief or performance in specie. And the requirement to return some particular item is referred to as specific restitution. An injunction, also known as a negative injunction or a prohibitory injunction, is a court ordered prohibition that prevents an action. Once again, we need the executive branch to actually require a party not to take some action. In this way, an injunction is the opposite of specific performance where a party is required to perform. But once again, they're similar in that they're rarely granted and require the executive to enforce performance or non-performance pursuant to a contract. In general, courts don't grant injunctive relief unless four conditions are satisfied. First, there has to be a likelihood of serious and irreparable harm. The party seeking the injunction must show that without the injunction, the party seeking the injunction will suffer serious and irreparable harm. Second, there must not be an adequate remedy at law. The party seeking the injunction must show that they cannot be adequately compensated by an award of money damages. Third, the court will balance the equity between the parties. The party who is seeking the injunction has to show that the benefit of the injunction to the party seeking it outweighs the harm to the party against whom the injunction is sought. And fourth, the court will consider the public interest. Granting the injunction must not unduly harm the public interest. Although injunctions are rarely granted, there are three situations where they're most commonly found. Non-competition agreements, non-solicitation agreements, and non-disclosure agreements. A non-competition agreement says that an employee of a company will not go work for a competitor. A non-solicitation or non-poach agreement says that a former employee will not try to attract executives from its former employer. And a non-disclosure agreement is a promise for someone not to share trade secrets or other confidential information. Although some states, most notably California, strongly disfavor enforcement of non-competition agreements under the concept that doing so would restrict the free flow of labor, other jurisdictions recognize that some people would not be hired, but for the ability to stop them from going to a competitor soon thereafter. 
So some jurisdictions will consider enjoining parties and preventing them from violating contractual provisions not to work with a former competitor, a former employer's competitor, or not to set up a new competition within certain geographic and time limitations. And most courts will enjoin parties to keep trade secrets, to not share confidential information. Non-poach agreements, the agreement not to take someone's executives, not to try to solicit someone to uh, leave a company that one was previously with, are somewhat in between in terms of their relative enforceability. Today, specific performance is awarded generally in cases involving very special land, pieces of art, or unique heirlooms. The trend is for courts to apply specific performance in proper circumstances. That could, for example, protect a party's continued supply of raw materials when doing so is in the public interest. The Uniform Commercial Code, which governs sales of goods, goods being things that are movable and identifiable at time of sale, also grants buyers the right to replevin, which is the recovery of goods in certain circumstances. We have now learned what are the remedies available at contract law and how to calculate the remedies involving money damages. Let's conclude this lesson with a brief recap. Any breach creates liability in the breaching party for some remedy. Once we've determined that there is some breach, the question becomes what remedy should courts employ? If the parties have already agreed as to some measure of damages, courts will generally award this amount of so-called liquidated damages unless the agreed upon damages turn out to be some excessively disproportionate amount in relation to the harm done so that they constitute an unconscionable penalty. In general, courts don't punish parties for failing to perform contracts, and so punitive damages are unavailable. Likewise, quote unquote, liquidated damages that are truly penalties are unenforceable as well. Rather, expectation damages are the preferred method of calculating damages for breaches of contract. Expectation damages are intended to award to the aggrieved party the benefit that it bargained for and reasonably expected. Expectation damages can include direct and indirect damages. Indirect damages include, in some courts' opinion, incidental damages, which are directly incurred as a result of the direct damages, and consequential damages, which are more indirect, but are approximately and foreseeably caused by the breach. Aggrieved parties have a duty to mitigate damages, or at least we could think of it as if an aggrieved party fails to take steps to mitigate damages, then expectation damages may be reduced or eliminated entirely. As an alternative to expectation damages, a party may instead seek and be awarded reliance damages, damages based on the reliance interest which instead of looking prospectively to how things would have been had the contract been performed, look retrospectively, seeking to put a party in the place it would have been in had the contract never been formed. Reliance damages are expenses that are incurred in preparation for or in performance of a contract minus those expenses that were avoided. Restitution is the subject of its own treatise, but as applied to contract law, recovery and restitution for contractual breach is measured by the value of the benefit conferred upon the other party. It's not inherently related to the breach. The breach and the amount of damages for the breach is related to, of course, reliance damages, which would seek to unwind them, and the contract value is related to expectation damages, whereas restitution relates to the gain from the wrongful party, the party who now has inequitable gain, who has been unjustly enriched. Restitution is a sort of quasi-contractual remedy, and it's available even in cases where contract law does not govern. Restitution generally comes as a form of money damages, but where one party is required to disgorge some specific item, that's called specific restitution, and it's a type of specific performance. Specific performance involves a court order directing one party to a contract to perform its obligations under that contract. Specific performance is an equitable remedy. Accordingly, issuance of an order of specific performance is subject to the sound discretion of the issuing court. 
A party is not inherently entitled to an order of specific performance, and it won't be granted if an award of money damages is an adequate remedy. Moreover, if the party speak seeking specific performance is guilty of bad faith, a court will be hesitant to award such an equitable remedy. The inverse of specific performance is a prohibitory or negative injunction, which is a court order prohibiting a contract party from taking an action in violation of a contract. I hope this video was informative and helpful. Please feel free to ask questions or provide insights in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.